Okay, so um, welcome back. Ding, ding, ding. Uh, welcome back to the, to the session, the second session. Sorry for distracting you from the coffee. Um, it's a very interesting session on uh, central bank balance sheet policies and interactions with the, the commercial banks. So the first paper here is um, by Gianni, Gianni Lombardo here um, and his co-authors. He's principal economist at the BIS in Basel. He was here many years ago. Let's not say how many, how many years uh, in the past. Uh, so welcome back to the to the to the ECB. Uh, you want to start immediately? No, I wanted to also to to introduce your discussant, <laughs> if you if you allow. Please. Moritz Lennel, um, a Princeton University, uh, will discuss the paper. is a is a good paper in my view. Uh, is a, is an interesting one. It says the QE could be done outside lower bound conditions uh, for macro prudential reasons. So it's uh, worth listening to it. Um, you know, the, then, then maybe a word on the, the second paper, extremely interesting as well, um, on uh, flightiness of deposits, particularly the deposits that are created in the process of central banks purchasing assets and uh, creating uh, expanding reserves. So another very topical paper uh, for later, discussed by um, Basso uh, Yanidou. Uh, unfortunately, uh, not here physically, but on uh, on screen. I see her. Uh, welcome to the to the conference. So Gianni, um, you have 30 minutes, and you know uh, not the rules of engagement here. 30 minutes, 10 minutes, and then discussion. Okay, so. Uh Thanks a lot for uh, including uh, our paper uh, in this conference. Um, I'm uh, mindful that uh, we have a, a slightly different perspective in terms of, you know, it's a very uh, macro uh, aggregated model relative to what we have seen here, but I think is uh, talking to a lot of the issues uh, that are central to this uh, conference. The paper is joint work with uh, Egemen Ren from the BIS, Timothy Jackson from the University of Liverpool, and I'm visiting the S&B uh, for a year until April next year, so the usual disclaimer applies for both the BIS and the S&B. So uh, uh, in terms of motivation, of course, you all know the story, the data probably better than I do. But uh, let me uh, just summarize that the size uh, of the balance sheet uh, of several central banks uh, after the GFC and uh, even more than uh, after the pandemic has uh, increased uh, many folds. Uh, now, uh, past the crisis, hopefully, uh, the debate is on uh, uh, how and whether uh, uh, the balance sheet of uh, central banks should be reduced and to which level. Of course, uh, both the uh, increase uh, of balance sheet uh, phase and the uh, reduction um, uh, relate to the idea that the balance sheet uh, of central banks matter uh, for aggregate outcomes uh, in different ways. There is, of course, a huge debate, uh, but the balance sheet, of course, is uh, understood, uh, especially after the uh, GFC, as an important part of the uh, central bank toolkit. Uh, so uh, the literature on the effectiveness of balance sheets and its role uh, is huge, uh, fortunately, uh, but mainly focused on using uh, the balance sheet as an unconventional monetary policy tool in periods in which the conventional tool, the interest rate policy, is constrained, in particular at the uh, zero lower bound. A few papers have dealt with uh, balance sheet uh, policies in normal times when uh, the conventional tool is, uh, um, is functioning, and our paper is actually contributing uh, to this uh, strand of the literature. Now, I have two slides on related literature I won't go through all of them, uh, just to mention 
you know, one strand uh, that talks about uh, having, uh, uh, you know, a, a relatively large balance sheets in order to uh, gain more attraction uh, uh, on, on two tools. This is the, 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 the paper by Ricardo Reich, where the central bank can uh, delink the policy rate and the uh, balance sheet when uh, this is sufficiently large, then the role of uh, reducing uh, le uh, the, the uh, role of uh, um, leveraged intermediaries in the supply of safe assets. And then more recently, the uh, few papers uh, involving John Williams on uh, uh, making sure that the supply of reserves is sufficiently large to reduce the volatility of the interbank uh, rate. Uh, we are, uh, so all these elements uh, in a sense will be uh, somehow reflected in our analysis, but two uh, other papers, a different strand of the literature is more closely related to ours. One is a recent paper by uh, Wiesing Jorgensen uh, and where she argues that basically the central bank in deciding the size of the balance sheet should consider uh, the uh, convenience yield that is uh, demanded on uh, reserves and, uh, and, and uh, treasuries mainly. And uh, she points out that in deciding the size of the uh, balance sheet, the central bank should aim at reducing those uh, uh, convenience yields, and there is a trade-off between the two, and so she finds that uh, in, on net, uh, a rather large balance sheet should be desired. Uh, uh, Peter Karadi and Anton Nakov here at the ECP have also produced an interesting paper where they compare balance sheet policies in normal times and in crisis times is very related to ours. I would say is complementary in many respects. An interesting point that they make is that large balance sheets uh, and uh, at times uh, generate, uh, central bank balance sheet at times generate low uh, profitability of intermediaries, which in turn might require even larger uh, uh, balance sheets. So there is a, a, a sort of addictiveness of uh, the, the, the uh, banking sector to the uh, large balance sheet of the central bank. So uh, uh, what we highlight, as it was pointed out before, uh, in our paper that has many of the elements of the previous literature, is that the balance sheet of the central bank might act as a macroprudential tool uh, in, in the uh, financial system. So uh, the, the uh, starting point is very related to Wissing Jorgensen uh, in uh, realizing that any uh, uh, decision concerning uh, the uh, size of uh, reserve supply, whether ample, abundant, and so on, will be reflected in the size, uh, you know, needless to say, in the size of the assets, uh, in the volumes of the assets demanded by the central bank. And, uh, and so this will affect uh, the net supply of those assets in the market. So the, 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 the central bank competes with uh, financial institutions in the demand for those assets. And uh, as it turns out, those assets are oftentimes uh, uh, displaying a, a, a different duration than reserves. And so in a sense, the decision of the central bank concerning the size of its balance sheet affects the net supply of duration risk in the market. So, uh, and uh, um, what we do to analyze these uh, things uh, is basically to use uh, a off-the-shelf uh, DSG model, as you will see, where we emphasize in particular the structure of the balance sheet of the central bank, uh, something that in uh, some elements of which uh, in, in most macroeconomic analysis have been uh, missing. Uh, the government plays a big role in our analysis uh, because it's the main supplier of the uh, duration risk of, uh, of, of safe, safe assets, but with longer duration risk. But, uh, you know, maybe a shortcoming of the current analysis is that we leave uh, the government otherwise in the background. There is no active role of the government except 
for uh, supplying those assets. And uh, what the central bank does then in this uh, environment is to choose optimally uh, both the conventional monetary policy as well as uh, the size of uh, its uh, balance sheet. And it does so to maximize welfare of uh, households. Yeah. I will come back to exactly what is the salient uh, feature of optimality here that matters uh, without you know, need uh, for us to get bogged down on whether the ultimate welfare of households it is, is the key or, or some other targets for the central bank. So what do we find? We find that uh, the long run uh, size and composition of the central bank balance sheet has implications for the effectiveness of monetary policy. So the key here is not maybe uh, differently from other uh, uh, analysis in this uh, uh, context, in this uh, conference. Uh, our main focus is to see the interaction between uh, uh, balance sheet policies and monetary policies. And, and the conclusion is that indeed this interaction is pretty strong also in normal times. And we do this uh, through a, a simple example. Uh, what we do, we compare two uh, regimes, one in which the central bank operates both with uh, monetary policy and balance sheet policies, and with the usual regime studied in macro uh, analysis, where the central bank only is concerned with interest rate policies. Now, if in the long run the balance sheet is optimally chosen, then we uh, showed that uh, uh, resorting dynamically uh, to uh, monetary policy only or a combination of monetary policy and balance sheet policy, so adjusting them along the cycle, doesn't matter uh, so much. So you can either conduct conventional monetary policy or monetary policy and balance sheet policies along the cycle, but as long as the longer run balance sheet is about the optimal level, then the two will deliver the same allocations. Uh, in contrast, is, uh, if monetary policy operates under a suboptimal balance sheet where considerations are not given to the size of the balance sheet, then uh, the outcomes in terms of uh, allocations and price movements will be uh, very different. So what is the rationale in words? And then I will dive into some, some more uh, technical details. Now, this, by choosing the optimal long run balance sheet, the central bank uh, chooses the, opt the socially optimal uh, duration risk uh, uh, exposure by banks. So banks don't internalize that there is a, a, a socially optimal level of duration risk uh, that might differ from what maximizes their profits. So more duration risks, risk eventually um, uh, generates more volatility in uh, balance sheets of uh, banks. Uh, this will generate volatility in lending, in yields, and ultimately in prices and allocation. And uh, moreover, if banks uh, don't see uh, debt and reserves as perfect substitutes, uh, which I claim they, they do in, to a certain extent, they don't, they don't equalize them perfectly, uh, then the central bank can uh, uh, choose, uh, can switch one for the other uh, with uh, real effects. So, uh, and uh, as I said, uh, once the central bank uh, chooses optimally this mix uh, or the level of duration risk, then monetary policy suffices to achieve uh, the optimum. Uh, so what uh, we say basically is that uh, uh, taking into account uh, uh, the, the uh, um, private sector balance sheet, how banks work, uh, even when you just uh, run uh, uh, monetary policy in a conventional way, so even if you are mindful, being mindful of that, as central banks always are, is uh, a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. You, you, you have to act the, to, to, to do something about your balance sheet uh, in, uh, in order to achieve uh, a better outcome. So in the rest of the presentation, I will uh, uh, highlight some of the features uh, of the model and present results uh, mainly in a pictorial way. 
So here, uh, the algebra that I'm going to show is just to uh, you know, help me highlight the assumptions that are behind our analysis. So you can uh, you know, uh, look away uh, if, if, uh, if you find this uh, too unclear and just listen to my uh, presentation of this. Uh, first of all, there is a government sector. The government uh, issues a quasi uh, a, a, a perpetuity in the sense that it issues some uh, bonds that have a, uh, um, an average maturity that can be regulated through this parameter delta. So we can decide what is the average maturity of, of bonds in the market. Some of these bonds are withdrawn. A fraction of these bonds are withdrawn each period and another fraction carries over to the next period. So uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, the government can uh, replace uh, the um, uh, withdrawn debt with the new issuance, but, but there is the, the key point is that there is a, a longer maturity of uh, average maturity of these assets. So this is what generates the duration risk. Uh, so uh, the government issues uh, this long-term debt that is held both by households. Here the households are kind of passive, don't play a big role, so they are not optimizing this choice for some technical reasons. What is more important, as I said before, is that these uh, long-term bonds are held both by the central bank, this curly B, CB, CB for central bank, but also uh, are held by private bank, uh, BB. So the two, uh, these two agents are in competition for the demand for uh, government debt. Uh, government spending is, in our case, just a random variable. Is, is uh, in our AR1 process. As I said, we don't specify very precisely the role of the government. It's, it's, it's just uh, an ad hoc uh, uh, element. And there is uh, lump sum taxation, so we are not uh, we try not to have a uh, um, distortionary effect of taxes so that we don't uh, generate uh, a macroeconomic effects through uh, the financial, uh, the, the fiscal uh, dimension. Um, in, in the paper, uh, the government holds uh, a real uh, debt constant over time. Now, the more important uh, part uh, is uh, the private banks. So we model them a la uh, Kiyotaki uh, and uh, Gertler and Karadi and Gertler. Uh, uh, Peter has, has uh, uh, further developed uh, um, uh, these models uh, considerably. Basically, for those of you that uh, still don't know this uh, uh, framework, uh, banks uh, try to maximize their franchising value, uh, denoted here by J, which is uh, a function of their network. And this franchising value is the present discounted value of their future uh, network. Uh, a fraction of these banks, one minus uh, theta, uh, leaves the market each period. The uh, other fraction, theta, uh, uh, leaves on to the next period. And so you can write, uh, in equation six, you can write the uh, franchising value in this recursive way. Importantly, the net worth, uh, net worth of the banks depends on their gross returns, on their uh, risky loans uh, to firms, denoted here by K. Uh, this is really uh, uh, capital, and Q is the price of capital, but this is a, is a proxy for, for uh, loans to firms that depend on, basically, on the profitability of firms. So they, there is an element of risk there. Then uh, banks also receive proceeds from holding government uh, debt. So the return on this debt is RB. And they hold, also hold uh, reserves, uh, denoted by uh, BF, uh, which pay an interest rate RF. And finally, uh, banks uh, can uh, run their business by borrowing from uh, uh, households uh, uh, deposits uh, D that pay an interest RD. And of course, uh, uh, this is summarized, all this is summarized in the balance sheet at the bottom of this, uh, of this page. Uh, now, in the uh, Gertler uh, uh, Kyotaki tradition, uh, the uh, banks uh, have, a, um, have, have a constraint. Uh, there is an agency uh, constraint in uh, uh, this model, whereby if the franchising value of the bank is uh, larger 
uh, then uh, the, um, uh, uh, the value of the assets held by the bank, uh, uh, weighted by some risk uh, measures, then the bank continues operating. But if the value of those assets is above uh, the franchising value, then the bank uh, better shuts down or defaults and takes what it can out of these, uh, of, of these assets. So these couple of parameters that play an important role uh, can be uh, thought of as uh, one minus the recovery rate in case of a bank default. An important point here is that we, we make uh, reserves and uh, uh, treasuries uh, uh, different uh, also in terms of this recovery rate. So we will consider what happens if uh, the recovery rate is higher for that, uh, for, for, or this kappa is higher for uh, treasuries than for reserves or vice versa. So we are open about that, but we will conclude that empirically uh, it is uh, kappa is higher for uh, treasury than for reserves. Uh, to the extent, other things equal, to the extent that the two are different, then you already understand that if the central bank uh, swaps reserves for treasuries, it will have an effect on the balance sheet of commercial banks, which will have an effect on credit yields, allocations, and prices. Uh, so the central bank now is, is uh, I would say, is rather familiar, except that uh, contrary to some uh, an, a similar analysis, we um, have a richer uh, balance sheet of the central bank uh, here in equation 10. So on the left side, uh, the central bank has uh, its assets, which is uh, uh, treasuries, BCB, and uh, the central bank uh, also ho uh, holds some uh, private sector uh, risky assets, which in, in this analysis and in, in the main part of the paper, uh, these are uh, kept constant, they don't play uh, any role. So the, balance, the central bank uh, has also some own uh, capital, is the net worth uh, NCB, and, uh, uh, and uh, among the um, liabilities, the central bank has uh, money. Here, uh, basically money here is defined as a liability that doesn't pay any interest rate. We, we, uh, uh, had this possibility to consider you know, the, the future in case of CBDCs, et cetera, but this is traditional old type money. Then the central bank issues uh, reserve, BF, and uh, pays uh, um, uh, some um, seniorage to the government or transfers some of these, uh, some of, of, of its uh, um, wealth to the government through TCB. And then the balance sheet, the, the, the evolution of the, of the net worth uh, of the central bank uh, is, 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 uh, is a mirror image of that of the uh, commercial banks. Basically, you can derive it. Uh, so we have, uh, in this analysis, we consider four shocks, uh, and, uh, and we analyze how they uh, have different implications for what we are going to say. There is a traditional uh, TFP shock, a government spending shock, then a net worth shock, a shock to the uh, amount of banks that exit uh, uh, the, the market each period. And a, a shock, I think this is an interesting shock, is a shock to the bank's demand for government debt, uh, which you can in, reinterpret this as a bank's demand for reserves. So we, we, for parsimony, we have only one. And so of these four shocks, you can think of two as real shocks and two as uh, 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 financial shocks. There is a calibration, which I, of course I, I'm going to skip, and uh, go straight to the results. Now, the first result is, in a, in a sense, what uh, 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 what Massimo was mentioning at the beginning, which I, I have to kind of a little bit uh, qualify what he said in terms of balance sheet uh, policies having a role also in normal time. This is not necessarily a, a new result. Uh, other people also here at ECB, uh, Oreste Tristani and Fiorella de Fiore have uh, papers where they point this out, and uh, Anton and, and Peter as well. But it's just to remind you that in a model where uh, uh, the uh, uh, two uh, uh, reserves and treasures are not perfectly substitutable, and they, they might have even different duration, then uh, uh, following a rule for the interest rates and the rule for uh, uh, the balance sheet, 
might generate uh, quite different responses to shock than simply uh, keeping the balance sheet constant and, and just running a Taylor rule. So there is nothing optimal here. It's just uh, an example uh, through impulse responses, which I'm not going to explain. It's just to sh for you to realize that the two colors in the graphs are different, uh, uh, depicts different lines. And so this says, look, uh, we know that in normal times, balance sheets policies along the cycle can have different effects. Uh, but we are focusing on the uh, long run balance sheet and how it matters for the effectiveness of monetary policy uh, in a traditional sense. So this is where I'm going to move next. So uh, what are the incentives uh, for the uh, central bank? Why is the central bank uh, thinking that uh, uh, the, the balance sheet can have effects for the uh, real economy? I show you this in a simple example. There is no duration risk in this, uh, in this case. So delta is equal to zero. The duration of reserves and treasuries is the same. On the vertical axis, I have uh, welfare. I'm not going to uh, delve into the quantitative aspects. And uh, these lines depict uh, uh, two different situations. The blue line is where uh, kappa B is smaller than kappa F. That is, uh, basically, reserves are riskier uh, than uh, treasuries. And the opposite is the red line. So let's focus on the red line. On the, on the horizontal axis, I have the share of uh, sovereign debt held by uh, the central bank, and if the share increases, also reserve supply increases. And you see that welfare increases up to the maximum debt uh, held by the central bank, which is to all debt uh, uh, in this uh, share of debt held by the central bank. So in this scenario, where should the central bank go? It should hold all debt in circulation. Okay, so, so the uh, uh, commercial bank should only hold uh, reserves. Why is, uh, is, uh, is kind of intuitive. I'm just uh, confirming what uh, your brain already suggests to you. If, uh, uh, you know, kappa B is larger than kappa F, so that is uh, riskier for banks, it's worse for banks to hold treasuries than uh, reserves, then uh, uh, make sure that banks uh, hold no treasuries, OK? And, and what happens in that case, just focus on the blue line again. Well, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, sorry, on the red line now, I, I know this is, I might have, did I switch colors? Yeah. Uh, I switch colors. So the red line now is where kappa B is larger than kappa F. And so the spreads, which is the spread between the rate paid by uh, firms to banks relative to the deposit rate, uh, goes to its minimum. So by doing this, the central bank can make uh, the economy more efficient. This is in a static environment, basically. But this gives you the intuition of why the central bank wants to uh, uh, calibrates its balance sheet depending on the role of reserves and uh, uh, reserves and uh, uh, debt in the balance sheet of banks. Now, with uh, with uh, duration risk, uh, uh, the same story it would be slightly asymmetric and so on. Now, uh, introducing money and nominal frictions become, uh, makes things more interesting. Uh, uh, so inflation distorts allocations of goods. It affects the cost uh, of holding real money balances. But in particular, the inflation risks affects the duration risks in important ways. So what I'm going to show you basically in the last three minutes is uh, this exercise of saying, OK, now, uh, Given all this, if the central bank picks the optimal level of uh, uh, the balance sheet in light of those uh, considerations, but then keeps the balance sheet constant over time and just uses the interest rate to manage the business cycle, how would that regime differ from a regime where the balance sheet in the long run is also optimal but the central bank also uses the balance sheet across, along the cycle. We have seen that using the balance sheet along the cycle has real effect. But how would the allocation differ 
differ between these two regimes if the balance sheet in the long run is really the optimal one. And you can see hardly any difference between the lines. The two lines are these two regimes. And there are different shocks and different variables, output inflation and spreads. But the bottom line is that although the balance sheet we know has real effects, over the business cycle, if you change it, if you pick an optimal level, which is an optimal ex exposure to duration risks by banks, then monetary policy is more effective. If you don't do that, well, yeah, if you don't do that, if you instead uh, pick a long run balance sheet, which is suboptimal, here is picking a balance sheet which is only 10% of uh, the level that it should have uh, in the optimal case. And then you respond to those shocks either only with monetary policy in blue or with monetary, monetary policy and balance sheet policies, then the allocations and price movements would be different. So uh, again, uh, the exposure to, long, to duration risk by banks makes the response of banks to shocks different if we generate exposure to duration risks would generate more volatility and therefore the economy would respond differently to shocks and this is why uh, having a different mix makes a huge difference for uh, ordinary monetary policy. So summing up, uh, when research and debt are valued differently by banks and they are different because of uh, the different what we call these uh, kappas, but these are a catch-all element to, uh, to highlight this difference, uh, then the central bank should supply as much reserves as needed to reduce the cost of capital. Okay, this was one of the charts where the spread would go down as much. Now, duration risk, which is highest in the presence of inflation uh, volatility, worsens the monetary policy uh, trade-off. So the central bank is aiming to stabilize inflation. At the same time, there is this financial channel that doesn't work properly due to this uh, excess exposure to duration risk. And so the two things generate a trade-off for the central bank. And so the central bank wants to address this by changing the degree of duration risk in the economy. And uh, when the, the balance sheet problem is addressed, then in a sense you can forget about balance sheet policies uh, during the business cycle and concentrate on uh, interest rate policies. But that is uh, a necessary condition for monetary policy to be as efficient. In that sense, uh, we see uh, you know, the, that uh, uh, we get a little help from a cyclical adjustment of the uh, central balance sheet in those uh, situations. So let me uh, conclude. Oh, no, uh, uh, I'm uh, running out of time. I just say that this is the sense in which the balance sheet has macroprudential properties. You set the balance sheet in order to make sure that the transmission channel of monetary policy through the financial system is uh, at its best. And then you can f uh, focus on monetary policy. Thanks a lot, and sorry for running over time. Interesting. Thanks a lot for uh, letting me discuss this very interesting paper. Uh, one of my PhD classmates, Egerman Aaron, on there, uh, so I was happy to, to read the paper. Um, uh, so the, the starting point of the paper, uh, there was a large expansion of central bank balance sheets all around the world post-2008. Um, the questions that this paper is asking are unconventional monetary policy even effective away uh, from the zero lower bound, and should the central bank maybe reduce its balance sheets to pre-crisis levels or keep these large uh, balance sheets that we're observing uh, at, the, at the moment. And the paper is basically Gertler Karadi, uh, if you have seen that, a model of unconventional monetary policy. Uh, reserves are modeled more explicitly. The central bank is passing reserves to the bank and they appear in the leverage constraint. So the leverage constraint of the banks is going to depend on all the assets, risky capital, uh, long-term bonds, uh, and also the reserve uh, uh, holdings. And the mechanism, um, I think Johnny explained that clearly, um, if, if bonds are kind of uh, constraining uh, the, the bank, banks uh, in particular and doing more risky lending, then more reserve holdings instead of those bonds is going to relax uh, the lending constraints. And so this makes quantitative easing an effective cyclical tool if reserves are scarce and there are too many bonds. Um, and it also makes, gives unconditional benefits of reducing balance sheet constraints. And so the central bank should basically always hold a lot of long bonds and issue a bunch of reserves in order to uh, unconstrain 
uh, banks. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the mechanism in a little bit more detail than the first slide. I'm going to take a bit broader view on, on, the, on the literature on conventional, unconventional monetary policy. So in Gertler Karadi, uh, the central bank basically acts as a credit intermediary. Uh, there are banks that finance non-financial firms subject to a leverage constraint. Uh, there is this constraint that the bank value uh, needs to be bigger than some fraction of the capital claims. These are the risky capital claims. And throughout, always the idea is we want to maximize those capital claims. As this financing of productive firms. There should be as much as possible uh, of, of, of that financing. And so if the banks are constrained and are not doing enough of this financing of risky capital claims, well, then the central bank can step in and can buy capital claims uh, with reserves uh, and act like an unconstrained bank because the central bank is not subject to the same uh, constraint uh, as the bank. It's going to relax the aggregate financing constraints, boost investments when banks are constrained. That's kind of the, the, the story here. So here, uh, the authors instead um, model central banks as duration intermediaries rather than credit intermediaries, I would, I would say. Uh, so here, the same constraint is a little bit more complicated. Reserves, which basically did not appear in the um, uh, constraint in Gertler Karadi, are now appearing with their own multiplier. Uh, and long bonds are appearing as well. And rather than buying uh, these, these risky capital claims, the central bank is now going to buy long bonds. Uh, and, and so if these long bonds are more constraining uh, than reserves, then the central bank can buy a lot of bonds, put, give banks instead these reserves, and that's reducing the financing constraints and it's going to boost uh, in, in, in investment. And so uh, as a summary of the paper, this is a kind of a very uh, natural, useful extension of, of this uh, uh, seminal Gertler Karadi framework, because now you can think about not only kind of credit purchases, but bond purchases, reserve quantities uh, matter. And we can think about the balance sheet size. I think a lot of key QE mechanisms that literature have, have discussed, like duration risk, uh, more the, the role of reserves, and relaxing constraints are kind of present uh, in, the, in, the, in this framework. And so I enjoyed very much reading the paper. Um, it seems a very natural uh, extension uh, of, 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 of this earlier work. So with that, the summary, uh, I, I want to talk for the rest of my discussion about chickens. Um, um, this is a comment about the whole literature on unconventional monetary policy. This is not at all specific uh, uh, to, to, to this paper. Um, most models, and I think basically all models on quantitative easing and unconventional monetary policy are chicken models. It's a term that goes, I think, back to Prescott. Uh, chicken models have three features. The first feature is that households like to consume chicken. The second feature is that households cannot con uh, produce chicken, but the government can produce chicken. And so we, then we ask a normative question, what should happen in this model? Well, the government should produce chicken. And that's <laughs> optimal policy in, in, in this world. And so uh, models of QE are, have all that feature. I'm not saying actually this is a bad feature, at least as positive descriptions of the world. Um, um, these three assumptions about the world uh, are make sense in a lot of um, contexts. I think the question about what the government should do is, is more complicated. So what, what are the different breed of chicken that the literature has dis um, discussed? So parts of channels of unconditional policy are private agents cannot issue safe bonds. The government can. Private agents cannot issue reserves, but the government can. They have limited risk-bearing capacity. The government doesn't have this risk-bearing capacity. Private agents have balance sheet constraints, as we saw here. The government doesn't have these constraints. Uh, or private agents act in segmented markets, but the government can actually interact across those segmented markets and therefore uh, uh, do uh, more. So the key question, I think, looking at this literature, which has grown massively, is uh, what is the right type of chicken that we want to look at? And then also importantly, why can households not produce chicken? Because if we ask a normative question of what the government should do, we have to also think about, well, what is the first step? Where, where do these constraints or these limitations uh, in the data actually come from? And should we consider those as well when we think about uh, normative policy? So here in this particular model, there's two assumptions uh, that are what the, what the households in the chicken model, or here the banks, uh, can or cannot do. Um, the key is banks have a leverage constraint, and the bank doesn't have. That's kind of really already in the, in the original Gertler Karadi model. Um, the government can, can circumvent that. And then the other one is that households that are also in the model, they don't participate uh, in, the, in, the, in the bond and reserve markets. And the government can kind of interact uh, here across. So if the first assumption was not there, if banks did not have a constraint, we didn't need to worry about this. The investment would be at the optimal level. And so it's really all about this constraint that, 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 that lets us intervene in, 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 in those markets. And the second, of course, if, if banks kind of un, up, unoptimally here held um, uh, kind of too, too much risk on their balance sheet, there's some externality. I am kind of glancing over some of the duration risk 
uh, channels that go on here. But, but largely, households would issue more short-term bonds. And kind of these banks here, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, they, would, they don't like these long bonds on their balance sheets. Households should hold them, and banks should hold safer, safer bonds to undo um, that uh, constraints. And so I think the first thing, always like looking at, at such a model, is like, do these assumptions make sense vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, uh, the data? Uh, are we looking at the right uh, chickens? Um, and it's true, so banks in the data, they face constraints. And these constraints are improve, Im imposed by shareholders, they're imposed by debt holders, uh, they're also imposed by the government. And so to the extent that they're imposed by the government, when we later ask normative questions, we of course should jointly think about policy and these regulatory constraints that maybe impose the need for, 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 for policy. And it's also true that the banks only can hold reserves and no one else participates in that, in that, in, in that market. Uh, it's again imposed by the central bank, so this is a, a question, do, do, would one, would one change, want to change that or not, uh, given this? And then I think what is key, um, at least the way I understood the mechanism, is these long bonds that the fiscal authority here issues, uh, they're really on the bank's balance sheet. And so uh, when the central bank is buying long bonds, then it is a swap on the bank's balance sheet of bonds for, 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 for reserves. That's the assumption, that's the only assumption where I'm like not completely sure whether that captures the data, how QE worked um, 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 well. I think that the takeaway for what I have from the empirical QE literature, I'm sorry I'm not citing anyone because the literature is so big and I will just offend people, but um, the, the, the central bank bought largely assets from non-bank investors. So in the US, the household sector, and in the end, also today with much better data, we basically know these are where the hedge funds, uh, they sold treasuries and mortgage-backed securities um, uh, to the central bank, indirectly, of course, through, through, through banks, but in the end, the assets came from there. And in the euro area, my, my reading is uh, foreign investors sold the sovereign bonds. I, I think for the corporate bonds, it's a bit more subtle, but still, I think it's not the banks uh, that, 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 that sold these bonds. So a constructive um, um, com comment, maybe hopefully for the, for the, for the paper, there's a, there's a variation that one could study in which it's the household that actually holds the long bonds. Uh, and they sell these bonds and convert them to deposits. And banks have to hold the reserve. That's still the assumption, I think, that, that makes sense given how the, how the data looks, um, with deposit balances. And so now, is it possible, there's a, there's a QE literature that asks, do reserves crowd out uh, capital financing? Because now central banks, ha bank banks have to hold these reserves and maybe cannot do uh, as much lending uh, and, anymore. So I think the model can naturally speak to this crowding out literature. Of course, Kappa F could even be smaller than zero. It could be very beneficial to have more reserves and could make bank operating more easy. And so having these reserves would not actually crowd out, but crowd in more risky investment. Um, various um, um, stories, I think maybe. Bruno Meyer, Zanikov, and Greg Sartavo, Schnabel, and so on, I think would have this kind of feature that more, more reserves, more liquidity allows for more risk investment. Stepping a step back, I think there's kind of some events on asset prices in the QE literature, and very little effects on the broader real evidence. So if you look in the end on these, on these impulse responses, they look interesting, but actually we don't know anything about whether there are any real effects of QE um, or not. My personal view is QE kind of moved outside of the banks, the convenience yield and collateral premium on, say, treasuries in the, in, in, in the US, but who knows? But that's kind of how I'm interpreting the, the limited spillovers to other asset classes. And then there's maybe a separate role for large reserve quantities with new regulation. And I think today's afternoon in the program is kind of talking about um, um, uh, that. So to conclude, it's a very simple quantitative model, allows a rich analysis of balance sheet policies, uh, captures key mechanisms, and could maybe add stuff like reserve crowding and other mechanisms that I, I talked about. I think normative analysis is incredibly difficult in chicken models. Uh, should the government produce a chicken or allow households to do so? Uh, in this context here, optimal balance sheets are always going to be a size of function of the regulatory and policy framework at the same time. And so um, I think it's, it's hard to make that, that point in the paper. So I think maybe there's more structural model needed of how do reserves affect central bank's decision, um, where this K kappa F here is a function of assets, reserves, and regulation. Uh, thanks a lot to the authors for writing an interesting paper and the organizers for letting me discuss it. So let's open the, <coughs> the floor. Any, any question, uh, Francesco? <clears throat> Sorry, from Brugger. A very simple question. Um, how can you reconcile your results that balance sheet matters also in normal times with the fact that currently quantitative tightening is taking place in Europe, in the United States, in the UK, uh, everywhere, and the market doesn't seem to care at all about it? I mean, if you look at the interest on interest rate changes, this is 
95% of the comments. Uh, 5% would be on what is happening to balance sheets. So that doesn't seem to fit with the idea that balance sheet matters also in normal times. Let's collect maybe another two. No, maybe, why, why, why don't you go ahead then? Yeah, so uh, thanks, Francesco. So. Uh, I, I, I totally uh, um, agree with you that uh, it's not uh, yet clear to which extent uh, the change in the balance sheet of central bank is uh, a worrying uh, issue right now or not, but my understanding is that the jury is still out and central banks are worried uh, of the possibility that uh, balance sheet, uh, that QT in many jurisdictions might uh, generate problems. Uh, in, in, uh, so just to highlight that in, in my case, uh, in our case, we, the, the, the idea is uh, does duration risk matters uh, for banks? So does this exposure uh, imply that banks are more vulnerable to uh, you know, asset price, interest rate changes? Uh, if they are, does this, uh, is this reflected in lending, uh, interest rates, allocations, and prices? And then if, given if that is true, uh, and my sense is that people believe that that matters, the exposure to duration risk matters, is it true that uh, uh, the balance sheet of the central bank by you know, changing the composition between reserves and treasury in the markets does affect this duration risk? So I think this is the line of thinking that I would have in mind. This is our, our perspective, uh, so we don't necessarily Focus, but but it might well be true that then empirically we will find out that uh, it won't matter. I mean, just observing like this, I think, is insufficient uh, to draw a conclusion. My, my sense is that central banks haven't drawn that conclusion. So uh, thanks, uh, Moritz, a lot for the uh, nice uh, discussion. Let me uh, maybe start and maybe finish with the chickens. Uh, and uh, one point that I, uh, because I, I ran out of time, I didn't stress, is that, of course, uh, there are two uh, implications of what we say. One is that macroprudential policies, in the more traditional sense, uh, could uh, achieve uh, a similar effects than a balance sheet policies. So if you think that there, there is a certain uh, uh, level of exposure to duration risks in banks, why don't you aim at that through regulation, through macro other macroprudential uh, tools? So in that regard, what we are saying is that uh, the central bank must be aware of these implications of duration risk. And given other, if given other policies, this duration risk is not ideal, then the central bank should know that by changing the, the, the size of the balance sheet, this duration risk will be affected. Now, the other agent here is the government. Now, so if the, gov if the problem is duration risk and the government is benevolent, is the government taking that into account when deciding the maturity structure of government debt? And so what we are saying is that, of course, that could, would play a big role. Uh, in fact, we have this delta. So this is, you can think of a, a fiscal parameter. It's something that the government decides. Mm -hmm. And so if the government could have decided to move this delta where it maximizes uh, welfare. What we are saying is that other things equal. So assuming that uh, other, other uh, institutions, uh, let's say, have not done their, uh, uh, what they should do, then the central bank should be aware of this and calibrates its policy so that to, the, to take into account this. Uh, so what the government, and or even going to the other extreme uh, that you mentioned, if the private sector can issue reserves and blah blah, then yes, you know you, there is an ideal world where uh, the central bank shouldn't worry about the size of the balance sheet. And so we are not saying uh, that that this would not be a better solution. We are saying that under the constraint that this, this ideal world, that we are far from this ideal world, the central bank in deciding the size of the balance sheet should keep in mind uh, what are the consequences for duration risk uh, in the economy because that will affect 
the transmission channel of traditional monetary policy, and so the effectiveness of traditional monetary policy. But otherwise, is uh, you're absolutely right. Is is a chicken is uh, uh, <laughs> is a, a chicken uh, model. Uh, uh, now, the, the central bank has duration uh, intermediary, uh, indeed, in, in, uh, to a great extent. We have also this black box of the kappas, where even without uh, duration risk, there is, uh, there is another, you know, the, 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 the things that offer different conveniences, and the central bank is intermediating in those, uh, so it's, it's slightly larger than this. But of course, we sh fall short of micro-funding this. I'm, 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 I totally... Uh, share the the view that I mean that this uh, the Gertrude uh, Kiyotaki model is a very rough approximation of uh, uh, how the financial intermediation works, but has the beauty that you can you can uh, uh, have a simple model to address these things. The same uh, response applies to the fact that households also hold that now. Uh, there is a technical problem here that if households uh, uh, are arbitrageur in the debt market, but also in the deposit market, then there is a problem. There must be s some segmentation. So we are very hard in these terms, and the segmentation is radical. Uh, households might hold some bonds, but they not, cannot trade actively in them. But I agree that it would be interesting to see a less a compact uh, model where there is there are different uh, layers, different agents, uh, hedge funds, for example, holding trading in bonds, and what is the implication for banks? Uh, this is I take for future work, but it's a very interesting thing. Uh, on the real transmission, uh, I, I understand that the the. It's not totally clear whether balance sheet policy have had uh, truly, uh, I, I, I would say that here the belief is that they had a truly <laughs> real and inflationary effects, but uh, it's, a, it's a good point. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, perfectly on time. So yeah, let's move meet up for the, <laughs> to, the second, to the second paper. Jen uh, Lee. Um, all right, uh, a big thank you to the organizer for putting our paper on the program. Um, it's a great pleasure to present this research to the audience. Uh, and thank you so much to the audience for staying uh, for the last paper on the morning session. This is co-authored with Christian at New York Fed. Uh, so the usual disclaimer applies. Also, she at University of Washington, who's also in the audience with us today, uh, as well as my colleague, Amy, from University of Col uh, Columbia University. Um, all right, so the paper starts with a very simple premise that deposits are a key source of funding for the banking system as well as the financial system more broadly. Uh, while when deposits are uh, sticky or rate insensitive, they facilitate uh, maturity transformation, they let the bank uh, lend out loans in a, in a safe way. However, when deposits turn uh, flighty or become more rate sensitive, then they can uh, create vulnerability in the system and potentially trigger panic-driven runs and cause uh, costly uh, asset liquidation. We're of course not the first one to think about depositor behavior, but if uh, most of the existing work, if not all, so far has been focused on studying different type of deposits in the cross section. For example, we know that wholesale funding are flightier compared to retail uh, deposits. Uh, insured deposits are less uh, flighty compared to uninsured deposits. Uh, we know much less about what is the time series variation of deposit flightiness over time. And that's what this paper will be focusing on. So we wanna first estimate what is the aggregate deposit flightiness at any given point in time. And more importantly, we wanna understand or look at how does it evolve over time. Then we're gonna think about what are the important drivers of this aggregate deposit flightiness, what drives this measure going up and down in a cyclical way. And then we're gonna think about um, the, implication, the policy implication of this time variation in deposit flightiness. And importantly, we're gonna um, highlight a link between conventional monetary policy and unconventional monetary policy through the adjustments in depositor base. So this figure uh, shows the um, time series variation of deposit flightiness um, over time. I'll explain uh, this rate sensitivity measure in detail later, but for now think about the solid line uh, as showing how sensitive are deposit flows with respect to rates. If bank raises its deposit rate by 1%, how much additional deposit flow does it attract? 
state. And uh, when this measure becomes more positive, it tells us that deposit flow in the banking system have become more sensitive to deposit rates. The first thing we notice is that there's quite a bit of uh, cyclical fluctuation in this measure. It stays relatively low before the 08 financial crisis, and they started to increase after 2010. I declined a little bit after 2015 before reaching a dramatic peak right after the COVID crisis. So we're going to try to look uh, for what is driving or try to understand a bit more what is driving uh, this uh, deposit flightiness um, over time. And we find that heightened deposit uh, flightiness coincides with large amount of aggregate deposit inflow into the banking system. Potentially, these are investors who are originally putting money in non-bank uh, investment vehicles like money market mutual funds. As they switch into the banking system to hold deposits, they increase the aggregate deposit flightiness um, in the system. This also corresponds to uh, periods when we have low interest rate environments, as well as uh, when the central bank engage in a large amount of quantitative easing programs where they expand their supply of reserves to the banking system. And we'll come back to uh, why that uh, drives the deposit flightiness. So we're going to take this uh, as, as evidence that there is significant variation in uh, deposit rate sensitivity uh, from the data, and we're going to construct a dynamic, dynamic uh, bank run model to look at um, its policy implications. Uh, so the model features uh, heterogeneous investors with different rate sensitivity. So think about institutional investors who are very uh, rate sensitive. They value the convenience benefits of deposits very little. On the other spectrum, you have retail deposits or households who are not very rate sensitive, but they value the convenience benefits of deposits a lot. When investors vary by rate sensitivity, then at any given point in time, those investors who are very rate sensitive or who value convenience less are going to pick uh, the outside option and stay in non-bank investment vehicles that gives them higher return while the investors who value deposits more, less rate sensitive by revealed uh, preference, are going to choose to hold deposits in the banking system. This implies that whenever we have an inflow uh, from outside investment uh, into the, bank, uh, the banking system, whenever we have this inflow, it automatically implies that the depositor base has become flightier compared to before. So when the monetary policy rate is low, it reduces the return of the outside option, which drives a in, uh, flow into the banking system. Also, when the bank is conducting a large QE policy, it's increasing its supply to the banking system. So the, it's increasing the supply of reserves that only banks can hold. While banks hold these reserves on its asset side, it's going to fund this asset by increasing the deposits. This attracts newly inflow deposits from outside of the bank. And again, these are going to be flight here depositors compared to those who are already in the banking system. Both of these policies attract new flows into the banking system, and they raise um, the average depositor flightiness in the system. So what are the impl policy implications uh, of the, uh, the heterogeneous uh, investor rate sensitivity? Well, uh, first of all, uh, because QE attracts these flight tier deposits into the banking system, it means that it amplifies the risk of subsequent policy rate hikes. So again, when QE or when the central bank expands its balance sheet size, it issues these reserves that only banks can hold, which are then funded by new incoming deposits. When these new incoming deposits are flight here compared to existing deposits, then a subsequent rate hike, a given degree of subsequent rate hike, because of flight here deposits, it's going to generate larger deposit outflows and larger increase in run risk. This suggests that when we're thinking about financial stability risk of monetary policy rate hikes, we need to pay attention of how much reserve is already in the system and how much QE has been conducted before. And second, it also has implication for the speed of rate hikes. So consider two cases. One is when the central bank uh, engage in a very drastic one-off rate hike, let's say 2% in one meeting, compared with another uh, more gradual rate hike where the central bank first increased uh, the interest rate by 1% in the first period and then another 1% in the second period. Uh, the, in, the, in the gradual rate hike case, it allows the depositors to flow out more slowly. It also helps the bank 
to sell assets in a more uh, slowly way. And if we think that there's slow moving capital frictions or it's more costly to sell a large amount of asset in a short period amount of time, then this gradual rate hike is gonna reduce um, the overall financial stability risk. So think about in the gradual rate hike case, in the middle period, when the rate is only increased uh, to 1%, the most flighty depositors would have left the banking system already. Because there's relative few or small fraction of them, the bank can potentially tap into its liquidity buffer or sell a small amount of assets to meet those outflows. When the rate is eventually increased to a very high level, those very flighty depositors has already left the banking system. So the bank has a relatively more stable depositor base compared to before uh, when the cycle started. Now this time, bank again will have an easier time to meeting these outflows. This is a joint statement about the depositor heterogeneity together with the asset market characteristics. We do need the fact that um, in the asset market, it's very costly to sell a large amount of assets in a short amount of time. Right? Great. Um, so interestingly, um, in the case of the Fed, the rate hike cycle that started in early 2020 um, it was both a very drastic or a very fast rate hike. The Fed increased 450 basis points within a one-year period. Um, and on top of that, it was a, a period of time when the central bank was sitting on top of a very large amount of reserves, uh, about $4 trillion of U.S. dollars at the time. Uh, both factors, uh, according to uh, our model, would amplify uh, the banking sector deposit outflows as well as financial stability risk. Uh, in the euro area, uh, cases are, are somewhat similar. The rate hike was somewhat fast, while the central bank had uh, a large amount of reserve, so similar mechanism could be at play. Um, going forward, we think it's also important to think about deposit of flightiness in conducting uh, quantitative easing programs or when we're reducing uh, the size of the central bank balance sheet. All right. In the interest of time, let me um, skip the literature and jump directly into our analysis. So we're going to use uh, a several uh, source of data to understand uh, the aggregate depositor flightiness, as well as looking at exactly what's contributing to the change in depositor flightiness over time. The first data source we use is uh, basically uh, just the bank level deposit volume, as well as the top deposit rates offered by different banks. The estimate, this flow sensitivity variable, we're going to look at the quarterly flow for a given bank. Um, I in, in a quarter T and regress this flow on an instrumented deposit rates offered by this bank, controlling for a time fixed effect. Okay. So we want to make sure that this deposit rate is uh, indeed a shock faced by the depositors. That's why we're going to instrument this deposit rate using standard IO instruments such as uh, the fixed cost and the salary expense faced by the bank. It's a cost shifter, so this goes into the cost uh, of the bank um, and it influences the deposit rates that the bank offers to its customers. Um, and we can use this shock to trace out the slope of the demand curve uh, from the depositor's perspective. The coefficient of interest is this uh, beta coefficient in red. It uh, tells us how sensitive our deposit flows with respect to uh, deposit rates. We're gonna run this regression at an eight quarter rolling window of frequency so we can get some sort of time variation um, in, in the data. Right. So here again is the deposit flow sensitivity over time. Um, it's the same figure that we've seen uh, at the very beginning in the introduction. We find that the monetary policy rates as an important uh, correlates very strongly uh, with this uh, deposit flow sensitivity. When the interest rate environment is low for long periods of time, that's when this uh, flow sensitivity is high in the data. Okay, this is consistent with the uh, deposit channel of monetary policy. Now notice that, however, the um, monetary policy rates does not predict exactly when the peak of the deposit sensitivity is. On the other hand, when we look at the supply of the reserve by the central bank, it lines up uh, surprisingly well. When the supply of reserve of central bank is high, that's when the deposit flow sensitivity measure is also high um, in the data. And at the peak, it lies, uh, aligns up uh, surprisingly well. Again, the reason that low monetary policy rates uh, or large supply of reserve could potentially affect deposit flow sensitivity is through attracting aggregate deposit inflows. 
So in the next figure, what I'm overlaying in orange is the cumulative aggregate inflow of deposits into the banking system. And again, we see that when the cumulative inflow is high, that's when uh, the deposit uh, sensitivity coefficient picks up. Right? So we can't um, uh, literally run the same analysis for the euro area. We don't uh, have the, necessarily data, the necessary data. But uh, in the euro area, at least the uh, uh, reserve growth and deposit growth are also uh, positively uh, co-moving in the data, suggesting similar mechanism could be also play um, in the euro area as well. Great. So although most of the, the focus of the paper is on the aggregate deposit uh, flightiness and, and its time uh, variation, we also uh, rely on some more granular data to help us understand exactly what's driving um, the change in flightiness uh, in depositor base. Uh, the first data we rely on here um, is um, a regulatory data from the Fed that allows us to see the deposit volume by counterparty type and by account type over time. Right? So the first thing we find is that uh, for, for this analysis, we're gonna try to zoom in to the uh, COVID period uh, because of the, the, the sample uh, limitation. What we find is that the growth and uh, decline in corporate deposits are much more pronounced compared to retail deposits, as you would imagine. So here, we split the deposit volume by different counterparty type. All of them are indexed to 100 at the beginning of 2020, uh, 2020 right before the COVID uh, crisis. And we see that in red line, that's the corporate deposits, it increased about 60%. Uh, until 2022 and then dropped about 20% after the rate hike cycle started. So that's a much more pronounced uh, fluctuation compared to other type of deposits such as retail or small business deposits. Now, why is this important? Well, because in the data, corporate deposits are much more volatile compared with retail deposits. So here we measure volatility as the standard deviation of corporate deposits scaled by um, the average uh, corporate deposits each bank has. And we find that the corporate deposits uh, are much more volatile compared to the other type of deposits, suggesting that this increase in corporate deposits right during COVID uh, contributed to the increase in deposit flightiness during that time period. Right. We're also going to, we also split the data by account types. We find that um, non-operation accounts grew more compared to operation accounts within the corporate uh, deposits. And also within retail deposits, transaction accounts uh, grew much more than non-transaction accounts. The crucial feature is that the type of deposit that grew more right uh, during COVID are also the type of uh, deposits that are more volatile. And so as the composition of these uh, deposits changed, that's partially what's driving the change in the aggregate deposit flightiness measure. Right. So let me skip this in, uh, in detail in the interest of time. Um, and then finally, we go uh, even to a more granular level and look at um, depositor uh, behavior. Um, so this, is, uh, this uh, data set lets us look at a bank account or transaction level data for uh, depositors that cover more than 1,400 financial institutions. The important thing for us is that we can see for a given uh, depositor, uh, what is its uh, transaction, how, how is it moving uh, money between its bank accounts, as well as how is it moving money between its bank account and investment accounts. Okay. So the first thing we'd like to uh, verify is that um, the inclination to move money between bank accounts, which is what our uh, deposit rate sensitive measure so far is capturing, is a good proxy for investors' inclination to move money between bank accounts and investment accounts. And that's confirmed in the data. So here we're plotting for a given investor the fraction of months this investor moves money between its bank accounts against the fraction of months that investor move money between its bank account and investment account. And for both households and corporations, these are uh, positively uh, correlated, suggesting that the type of people who are moving a lot of money between their bank accounts are also the type of people who are moving money frequently between the bank accounts and outside uh, non-bank accounts. Right? Uh, the same uh, results are robust to using other measures of uh, uh, flightiness or inclination to move money. 
So then we repeat uh, the same analysis uh, using this uh, micro data. We look at uh, how sensitive are depositors' bank to bank flow, how sensitive is that flow with respect to the difference in, in deposit rates. We estimate this period and pe by period and plot the sensitivity coefficient over time. It resembles very well what we get uh, using bank level estimates at the very beginning. We can replace uh, the Y variable with uh, flow between bank accounts and non-bank accounts. So now we're looking at money moving in and out of the banking system. How sensitive is this flow with respect to the deposit rates, which is uh, or deposit spread, excuse me, which is measured as the difference between deposit rates and the Fed fund rate. And again, we see that this uh, time variation uh, in the sensitivity coefficient measure resembles well uh, what we've seen uh, when using the aggregate uh, bank level data. And so this confirmation between micro using micro data estimates and, and the bank level estimates give us some confidence that, that we're capturing something um, real in the data. Great. So we're gonna uh, take these uh, empirical findings as given. These empirical facts uh, support strongly that investors indeed have differential rate sensitivity um, in the data. We're gonna take this as an input and construct a model that takes the, that it takes the investor or deposit composition as endogenous and it's uh, endogenous with respect to the past realization of fundamental shocks as well as policy shocks. Right. And we're going to use the model to do counterfactuals and understand the implication for policies. Right. So the model features a continuum of infinitely lived investors. These investors are heterogeneous in um, the convenience benefit they derive from holding deposits. That's denoted by theta. Investors with high theta, these are investors that value convenience benefit a lot. These are my low rate sensitive investors. While investors with low theta, those are the high rate sensitive investors. Each investor can choose whether to put $1 in uh, a bank deposit or invest in outside option like money market mutual funds where the interest rate or the return R is mostly controlled by the monetary policy rate. On top of that, we, uh, there's also a fixed switching cost F when investor wants to move money in and out of the banking system. The role of the fixed cost is that it gives us path dependency in terms of the investor base at any given point in time. Okay. We model a representative bank as issuing deposits to fund a long-term illiquid uh, project. The project is um, long-term in the sense that it only matures with a less than one probability each period. It only generates cash flow upon maturity the cash flow it generates in period T, if matured, is denoted by YT. So think about uh, this YT as approximating the bank's asset fundamentals. When YT is high, that means the bank is generating a lot of return from its loans and, and securities holding, it's doing great. But when asset is low, the bank is not doing so well. We're gonna have um, strategic complementarity among households um, in the background. So think about this uh, asset quality YT as a signal that coordinates household behavior on whether they wanna run on the bank or not. Okay. When there's deposit inflow, uh, the bank is gonna invest these deposits. It's gonna scale up its asset side in a frictionless way at per unit cost one. When there's deposit outflow, the bank has to sell its assets in order to meet this outflow, and there's some potential frictions there. Specifically, when the asset sale is small, it's a small, it's less than five fraction of the total assets, then liquidation is frictionless. You can sell your assets at the per unit price one. However, if the asset sale is too large, it's larger than five fraction of the total assets, then the liquidation price drops to a level below one. And this liquidation cost, this difference between one and, and liquidation price L, is what's giving the strategic complementarity among the uh, depositors. Bank's problem is very standard. It tries to pick a deposit rate to maximize equity value, taking into account potentially the effect of deposit rates on deposit flows. Okay. So in terms of timing, each period, uh, given the realization of asset fundamental value Y, and existing depositors, that's denoted by this big theta T. So these are the depositors inherited from last period who are already in the banking system. Given these two uh, state variables, the bank chooses uh, what rates to offer, and investors looking at that rate decide whether they wanna invest in deposits or be in the outside uh, investment option. 
If it turns out that deposit outflow is too large in a given period, the bank is forced into liquidation and fails, then the asset is uh, sold at the liquidated price and distributed to existing depositors. Importantly, the bank default probability is endogenous and depends on both the asset side fundamentals as well as the existing depositors who are already in the banking system. If the existing depositors are very sticky or value convenience benefit a lot, then a given amount of negative shock wouldn't push the bank into a default territory. On the flip side, if depositors are very flighty, then the same degree of uh, negative fundamental shock might push the bank into a default territory. Great. So in equilibrium, at any given point in time, we have the sorting of investors. The type of investor who value convenience um, a lot are going to choose to be in the banking system. Uh, those are the investors with theta above this endogenous theta T threshold. Depositors who don't value convenience that much are going to choose to be in the outside option. Their theta is below this endogenous threshold. So we're going to call theta T our marginal depositor, and it's an important state variable for us to keep track over time. Again, the direct implication is that whenever we see an inflow of investors into the banking system, implies the marginal depositor is flightier now. The other equilibrium object is the endogenous bank run threshold. So there exists an endogenous threshold Y star such that when the uh, asset fundamental is below this Y star, that's when the bank experiences a run and, and fails. Importantly, this uh, run threshold Y star and the default probability increases uh, when the marginal depositor uh, values deposit convenience less. So if the marginal depositor is more flighty, then the bank with a small degree of negative uh, asset fundamental realization, uh, it's going to face a bank run. All right. So in the remaining uh, five minutes or so, let me tell you a bit what we do with this model, um, with the type of counterfactuals uh, we look at. So we know that when the monetary policy rate hike, uh, monetary policy rate increases, we're going to think of that as mapping to a higher return in the outside option. So the return on money market mutual fund goes up. We know this is going to lead to more deposit outflow and increase in financial stability risk. What we want to further understand is what do the outflows and increase uh, of run risk depend on from the same degree of rate hike. Okay. So we're going to use a calibrated version of the model to investigate two effects. First is the effect of uh, QE or unconventional monetary policy. The way we think about QE is that it attracts a lot of inflow or deposits into the uh, banking system. Hence, it's making the marginal depositor in the banking system flightier than before. This is true as long as the central bank is not only buying bonds uh, from the bank balance sheets, as long as buying some of sort of bonds from non-bank uh, investors, it's going to have this in effect of um, increasing um, the marginal depositor uh, flightiness through attracting more deposits into the banks. When the uh, marginal depositor becomes flightier, the run risk for a given degree of rate hike is amplified. Uh, this is true as long as not all reserves are costless, that came from QE are not costless to sell. And we know uh, those reserves are not uh, perfectly liquid, uh, given the work of Daryl and, and Quinton. Those ample reserve uh, is also costly to liquidate from an individual bank's perspective. Right. The second thing we're going to look at is the effect um, of the speed of rate hikes. So in this world, again, we're going to compare two cases. One is when the central bank raises rates by 2% uh, in one meeting versus a slower rate hike, where that same degree of rate hike is split over two periods of time. Because the slower rate hike allows depositors to flow out gradually, and by the time we re reach uh, the high rate environment, the existing depositor is more stable compared to before, um, the slower rate hike uh, will reduce the run risk coming from uh, the same degree uh, of uh, rate increase. Right. So for the baseline, we're going to consider this 2% uh, rate hike uh, with a given degree of, of persistency coefficient assumed. We find that the rate hike uh, is more destabilizing after QE or reserve injection because of the change in marginal depositor base. So what I'm plotting here is the increase in default probability coming from this 2% rate hike plotted against the marginal depositor type in the banking system, theta t minus 1. 
So think about QE as attracting more inflows, and so it's moving this theta t minus one to a smaller level, a more flighty depositor base, which is mapped into a higher increase in bank default probability. So this channel highlights um, a very interesting interdependence between conventional and non-conventional monetary policy through the adjustment in depositor base. The fact that the rate hike happened after a large scale of QE suggests it's gonna have a more destabilizing effect than otherwise. So the second uh, counterfactual we look at is comparing a drastic rate hike of 2% in a one-time uh, race versus a more gradual rate hike, just 1% in the first period and another percent in the second period. Regardless of the depositor, uh, marginal depositor base theta, um, the change in default probability coming from this overall rate hike cycle is larger in the drastic case compared with the gradual case. And the intuition is that in the gradual case, you let the flight to your depositor out first in the intermediate stage before you eventually reaching a very high rate level. So put some um, numbers uh, on, on these effects. We're gonna think about uh, QE as uh, changing the depositor base as we're gonna move this theta t minus one such that the overall change in deposit volume matches with the reserve change in the latest QE cycle during COVID. So that's about 18% increase in the overall deposit base. So we adjust the marginal deposit uh, correspondingly such that the overall change of, of deposit volume matches with the data. And we find that the uh, forgiven a 2% rate hike subsequently uh, is gonna increase bank default probability by 73 basis points. But if we had done the same rate hike without QE or any reserve, the latest round of reserve injection, the increase in default probability is 45% less. So only 40 basis points and the same effect could be achieved by raising the rate uh, in a slower fashion. Right. So with that, um, let me conclude. Um, the paper uh, shows that dep uh, deposit flightiness uh, varies a lot uh, over time in the data. Um, if we live in a world that investors are indeed heterogeneous in rate sensitivity, then an influx of deposits automatically imply an influx of flightier deposits, given investors' endogenous choice we highlight an intricate link between conventional and unconventional monetary policy through the adjustment of depositor base. Um, and finally, given the rise of the MBFI sector, the substitution and flow between bank and non-bank uh, will only become more significant going forward. And we think the mechanism we highlight uh, could become, uh, are here to stay, if not stronger. Um, thank you so much uh, for the attention. I look forward to the discussion and comments afterwards. Thank you. Uh, yeah, Vasa, please. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, so uh, it's a pleasure to, to have the opportunity to discuss this paper. I'm really sorry I couldn't be with you in person today. Uh, British Airways had different uh, plans for me yesterday. Uh, so let me, let me start uh, with uh, a little bit of... Um, oh, oh, my slides move too fast. Um, you're muted. Uh, Hello. Yeah. Can Hello. you hear me? Okay. Now. Yes. Can. I'm sorry. Uh, so the paper is, uh, the main focus is about understanding the variability of uh, deposits at the aggregate over time and the implication this has for financial stability. Um, one of the key points the paper is essentially making is that uh, we have an elevated deposit flight in NS after the COVID crisis. Um, and the key, the key point why that happens, this is the central point of the paper, is because the deposit base became flighted. Okay, so basically during the COVID period, for a variety of reasons, whether it's the low interest rate, QE, COVID, and so on, uh, brought in a new base of depositors that normally they, they look for um, different investment products uh, 
uh, which pay higher interest rate. They brought them into the banking sector. Uh, and this uh, and these sort of depositors or deposits tend to be more flightier. They care less about the convenience of deposits versus uh, the return on deposits. And so when later on rates uh, increase, um, these uh, more uh, rate sensitive deposits uh, basically fly out of the of the deposit system, creating instability. Um, I'm having some difficulties moving the the slides, all right. So let me highlight uh, a little bit what I think is the, the key, the uh, contribution of the paper. So it offers us a very interesting empirical documentation of this time varying deposit flightness. Uh, it also provides a dynamic model explaining these uh, changes in composition, providing a nice uh, setup for analysis, calibration, and estimation for quantifying some effect. The, the results have, have, have very clear implications. They, uh, they tell us basically it links, uh, if you want, uh, the QE programs to heightened um, bank run risk later on for a given interest rate hike. Um, if, uh, if this rate uh, hike has been preceded by QE programs that have uh, brought in um, you know, an unusual uh, uh, inflow of deposits into the banking sector is going to uh, lead to a, a, a higher variability. It has also implications, as the authors highlight, about uh, possibly um, uh, pacing rate hikes uh, for uh, banking stability, if you want to. I will come back to this result in a minute. Now, um, so what I, I find as a, a sort of the real strengths of this paper is, is really, I, I find the central thesis, the key point, um, both reasonable and intuitive. The transaction data that the authors are using, uh, transaction level data they are using to, to study the movements uh, between banks or between banks and investment accounts are really unique here, okay? So we, we don't have that in many other settings. Uh, and, and as I will explain in a minute, they bring in a lot of novel insights. Um, the modeling is also uh, innovative and offers uh, interesting um, um, uh, uh, framework to, to understand the concepts here. And as I mentioned, this is uh, super important in terms of uh, policy relevance. Um, now, in terms of a roadmap, what I'm going to do right now is uh, use the remaining time to highlight some of the uh, novel and, and interesting results of the paper. And I will tell you why I think these are important and, and, and what is really different in here in, in some sense. And also offer some uh, uh, comments for further uh, uh, consideration. So um, uh, beyond the paper, uh, some of them. So they're not meant to, to be a referee report of a paper, but more on sort of thinking on a, on a picture, uh, uh, what we could be looking uh, in addition or what maybe is, is not fully captured. Um, Oh, sorry, this moves too quickly. So, um, yeah. Uh, the first thing uh, to highlight is the data very clearly show a, a, a lot of variability in recent years uh, in the sensitivity of, of, uh, of deposits uh, over time. This coincides with the you know, low, low decreases in interest rate, low interest rate environment, and later on with uh, QE programs and so on. So, um, now, what uh, the authors tell us uh, very clearly in their results uh, is that what is not due to, so the fact that it coincides with this progress doesn't necessarily imply that these are the causal reasons, but what we know is not possible explanations is first, uh, other research has shown that in recent years we had a shift of deposits from time to savings uh, 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 accounts. This is not uh, part of, of the reason for which we see this increase in uh, sensitivity because uh, um, the results and this uh, same pattern exist even if you just simply analyze within savings deposits. We also, is not due to uninsured deposits, variations in the share of uninsured versus insured depositors because one lo if one looks at the data and the fluctuation in these variables, the time series pattern doesn't, doesn't fit. Um, now, the thesis, as I mentioned, that is uh, put forward by the paper and supported by the result is the idea that uh, you had this influx of, of uh, flightier depositors into the banking sector, which is very clearly documented. If you look at the period of the COVID, you can see a very big increase in non-operational accounts by um, uh, firms 
and uh, sweep and broker accounts here. So these are the, the, the two showing uh, uh, plus transactional accounts here. Now, when the authors analyze the variability with the very detailed transaction data where they can trace movements within bar between banks or between banks and other investment options, um, and, and these are, again, very unique. Uh, we haven't uh, had such data in, in other settings. What we are learning is that uh, non-operational accounts of, of firms um, are, are a lot more volatile. And the same holds also for transactional accounts of retail depositors. So a key takeaway, if you want, from this result is that the purpose of the account, rather than actually the depositor itself, whether it's a, I mean, of course, the depositor, if it's a firm or a, or a household, matters, but also the purpose for which. So even if we look at the data, even the transactional accounts of, uh, of households do show quite significant uh, variability. So it, it emerges as an important insight here, and I will, I will encourage to look at uh, further because we, we don't have that otherwise. Um, another, okay, so this is very volatile as I'm moving. So, right, so another highlight here, so the authors are able to do within depositor analysis, right, with, with depositor fixed effects at the, at the uh, and study and, and get estimates of the uh, sensitivity of depositors, uh, and we can see if you study bank to bank or outside investment to bank, so both of these, uh, you can see this uh, significant variation in variability within depositor. So it's not about uh, necessarily only the depositor, but maybe is is what they are that particular depositor is using these accounts for. So if it's a non-operational account of a of a company they are flighty deposits because the switching costs are low the same holds for transactional accounts of households uh, stick uh, uh, accounts of households that are there for savings for the future tend to be much much uh, uh, stickier um, one important insight that comes from the paper is that the, these two if you look at bank to bank movements and outside investment to bank they come move Okay, so they, 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 you can see that in the time series, they also show it in a, a very nice cross-section in, in another uh, beautiful graph. But basically what we are learning here from this is that uh, the same depositors who becomes flightier in moving uh, funds between banks is also uh, flightier in moving them in and out of the banking sector. And I think this is new and it's important. I often had discussions, I mean, at, at the ESRB, we have been looking at the issue of flighty deposits and we, we wrote a report recently. And the issue of, uh, uh, when one looks at the literature, most of it is using to study depositor behavior, most of it is using micro level data, studying how depositors are going out from a particular bank. But uh, um, if you ask the macroeconomists, we say, do we care about these results? Are they important? Um, because if they are not going out of the banking system, we shouldn't care for it at the aggregator. And I think we should, uh, to start with, for other reasons, but uh, these results further reinforce that. Uh, so I find this result particularly interesting, and I will encourage to, the authors to sort of produce graphs like this, not only um, between A and B here, but also by type of depositor and by type of account, as to understand whether indeed uh, um, maybe the same depositor, depending on what is using these funds for, is going to be acting uh, differently as to understand where is exactly the source of, uh, of, uh, of variation coming from. Now, let me sort of, that, that concludes to what I wanted to highlight about the results. Uh, and the author has also explained many more of these results. Now, let me step back and sort of uh, offer a few comments of what uh, beyond the paper or, or sort of um, uh, some suggestions and, and so on. So the first thing that came as I was reading the paper is how much of what I'm seeing here is specific to this very unique period, right? So it's not only the, the QE programs which uh, will happen, it's not only the uh, dec prior decreases in interest rate and future increases, which if we go back in history, you will see that also as well. It's also the COVID, which basically created a lot of uncertainty, brought in uh, 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 funds into the banking sector that normally wouldn't be there. So I, I, it will be interesting uh, and valuable if the authors could extend the part of the analysis. I know the more transaction level data can, are not available earlier, but the call report data and the initial part of the analysis is possible. Whether well, they could go back a bit in, more in time, I know they do analysis from the 2000, but even earlier to see other moments in time 
that uh, uh, we had large variations in, uh, in inflows or, and outflows of, of deposits to see if you can if you can see similar uh, results. Um, I don't uh, just uh, a lot very often in in, in in the empirical work we are uh, very interested in having exo obsessed with having exogenous variation and there is a, a literature that has looked in exogenous variations of deposits into the banking sector. I don't think this is going to be. Use, helpful here because what we are interested in is the endogenous movements, the, the ones that are coming in for endogenous uh, reasons. Um, now, so when the authors discuss the implications and also the, how they construct their, their, their different counterfactual analysis, uh, 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 basically the idea is uh, two policy implications about monetary policies that if, the, if say, if the Fed could have uh, reduced the, the, the balance sheet size that may have helped, in, in terms of the uh, stability implications on the run risk, the probability of, of getting to the to the probability of default uh, and and run, and and smaller steps have uh, will all steps in in rate hikes will have also mitigated run risk. Now this may not always be feasible. It has to do with the timing of the inflationary shock that the central bank is facing is face off. It may also not be desirable if uh, if uh, there is a, an interaction. Uh, there is a, you know, there are issues about uh, the mandate, and, and you know, the mandate may be inflation, um, not financial stability, or you know. So, uh, what I would have uh, uh, been interested in to see more, maybe in this paper or in an additional paper, is some additional analysis about uh, using the data or the, or the uh, um, existing data here. Uh, and the model expanding to see what banks can or what banks are actually doing to mitigate the high flight risk themselves. Rather than, okay, uh, that could uh, all, uh, help to complement whatever a central bank may be doing. Uh, let me be more specific. Um, I mean, if we look at the model, there are the investors, they are heterogeneous and so on, and, and what the banks are doing here, they're choosing the deposit rate to manage that interest rate risk. So the key lever for managing the outflows is the interest rate. Now, um, there could be other levels that the banks can use. Um, so, so, for instance, what other levels can the bank have? Well, uh, it can potentially increase endogenously the amount of liquid, uh, liquid assets they are holding as the deposit becomes flighter. They could introduce increased switching costs. So in the model, the switching costs are exogenous and, and, and they are fixed. Uh, but potentially, this can be uh, things that uh, the individual bank can can adjust. Uh, think of time restrictions, redemption costs, bundling products. All of these things uh, could not only influence and manage the outflows uh, by creating stickiness, but they will also inf uh, reduce inflows to start. So they will re reduce the procyclicality. The other thing I would like to highlight is actually on the top here is about the fact that deposit insurance is notably absent from the model and from the calibrations. I agree is not, if I look at the time series graphs the authors are providing, I agree is not the key reason for, for the uh, volatility, but I suspect it's influencing the, the estimates the authors obtain in the counterfactual exercises about the, the default risk. Um, so when it comes to here, the point about uh, uh, banks increasing their liquidity assets, it may sound to some degree a little bit too optimistic to, 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 to think that uh, they will internalize that. Uh, if I look at a study we have done, a, rec uh, a recent study we've done with co-authors uh, using Italian data where it was a case where the bank's funding has exogenously been shocked through a tax reform and so banks uh, had a lot more uh, funding uh, from deposits, which were demandable contracts. Therefore, they, are, they have the possibility of, of, of flightiness. So deposits can, can they are, it's a demandable contract that can be redeemed, as opposed to what was the, the counterfactual, which was bank bonds that were uh, not uh, sold in liquid markets. So from the perspective of the bank, the, the funding was secure. What we see in the data and shown in this graph uh, is that the banks, uh, as the deposit funding has increased, the banks who saw larger increases in deposits have increased the, the share of, of liquid, uh, liquid uh, DD ratios they hold themselves without any regulation. Uh, they, of course, also increase the amount of, uh, of uh, credit lines they provide, and, but uh, 
um, the, as, as predicted uh, by Kasia, Brajan, and Stein. Uh, but uh, the two, due to a synergy, they are not going to be one to one. So I think it would be interesting if the authors could uh, uh, expand a little bit here to understand the degree to which banks themselves are internalizing. So look a little bit more on the asset side about what banks are doing to to take into account this. Um, so in terms of the you know the issues about what can you do or and to re to increase switching costs, if one looks at the empirical deposits literature. Uh, when we are looking at uh, cases about how depositors run, we do know that uh, um, keeping depositors who want to run in with uh, hikes in deposits is extremely costly to the bank. Uh, we also know that loan linkage uh, tend to mitigate um, uh, the outflows. Um, uh, now, this, these are estimates that are drawn when uh, in episodes where the depositors uh, aggregate uncertainty is high if you want to. Uh, in this paper or where depositors are, are basically concerned about the safety of their assets rather than they are going for a, a, a higher return elsewhere. Uh, so it will be uh, helpful to, to see how much of, uh, of, of the insights we are getting from, from this literature will hold for keeping uh, mitigating uh, switching costs could be helpful. Um, so uh, let me conclude, uh, so I'm, I'm sure I'm out of time. I think this is an interesting paper. It has a several novel results. The central thesis is both believable, plausible, uh, and, and has, uh, has implications about uh, monetary policy. Uh, it was a fun read for me, and thank you for your attention. Do you want to, do you want to respond? Uh, or we, maybe we take, we, we take questions first. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. We, I want to pick up on Janine's uh, point. Oh, we're on, we're on line, so I need a microphone. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yanidis uh, raised a point I'd want to, I want to explore with you. Uh, there's two reasons of, for the flightiness. One is rate shopping, and one is fleeing uh, weak banks because they might default. I want to understand better if it's rate shopping, and given that, I want to understand better what are the cost benefit on having flighty depositors. If you think about uh, the inefficiency in the deposit market, maybe rate shopping is a good idea. Uh, is it, I mean, we also know from historical evidence, like a paper, a recent paper by Stefan Luck, uh, that almost all bank failures, it turns out, are not uh, generated by depositor runs. They're generated by insolvency. SVB would be an example. For the rate shoppers runs, we're in a central bank, they do provide backstop funding against collateral, and they're there for you. So are you really concerned about the dangerous situation of depositor flightiness, or are you finding evidence that maybe depositors are doing a better job in certain circumstances at equating marginal sub, uh, rates of substitution for savings uh, between themselves and the banks? I see a question there, or there. Yeah, thanks, Matthias Drehmann from the BIS. I have a question. So you talk about QE and QT driving deposit of flightiness. Can I translate the empirical results and the model also in a steady state sense in the way that we are talking now about the steady state size of the balance sheet? So if I have a 10 times larger balance sheet, the flightiness of deposits and the financial stability risks will be higher than if I don't. Yeah. Question. Excellent papers and excellent discussions. Now, this is Amy. Um, in fact, I think the two papers in today's session are closely connected. Be it duration risks on the asset side or flightiness on the deposit side, the authors are trying to say there are a aspects of the banking sector that could have systemic risks. So what role should central banks play? And I would love to have your thoughts on how to think about the implication for central banks, given the heterogeneity that we could have in the banking sector versus the, uh, the impact of central bank actions that would uniformly apply to all of these banks. For example, every single bank has an asset liability committee. And so perhaps 
each bank would be particularly suited to think about the duration or the deposit flightiness facing each bank itself, as opposed to relying on potentially blunt tools from the central bank, be it about adjusting QE, QT actions, or rate hikes. Thank you. Just one more, because we are already over our time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the discussion. This is uh, Daryl Ho from Hong Kong Monetary Authority. I just wonder whether, you know, if we try to collect the observations on the bank runs, you know, uh, in, in historically and compare it to, you know, the whether it is correlated with the particular part of the monetary cycle, I think that would be quite interesting. And the second thing about policy reaction to the findings. So if it is true indeed that, you know, the flightiness would actually increase during the tightening cycle, shouldn't it be something that the Basel committee can actually to look at it? For, for example, when we look at the liquidity coverage ratio, you know, we assume there's certain outflow rate in certain deposits. But now we have an additional piece of information about, you know, how this outflow rate may behave, you know, during the tightening cycle or in the different parts of the monetary cycle. So that, that may actually have uh, some implication about how we shall calibrate our policy on the banking side. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for um, the great discussion. Um, that was very helpful for us. Um, and also thank you for the comments. Maybe in the interest of time, I'll, I'll try to consolidate and, and combine uh, some of the responses. Um, so on the comments, first on the, uh, the bank risk management. Yes, we've thought actually a lot on uh, how would bank potentially try to manage its depositor base. Um, so the, the, the inside of the model goes through as long as not all the inflow from deposits are invested entirely into uh, liquid assets. So if the bank splits the inflow of deposits uh, between liquid and liquid asset because your liquid asset offers a higher return um, than the inside of the model goes through. But we can definitely uh, take this into account more when doing the quantitative analysis. I think that's where uh, it potentially really matters. Um, and on Daryl's question on uh, the rate shopping versus uh, response to fundamentals of the banks. So um, in the model, they're actually very, we're basically thinking about them as very similar characteristics of the investors. Investors are thinking about the expected return they get from holding deposits, which includes uh, the rate, but also uh, the fundamental of the bank, how likely are they getting the rate, their money back at the end of the day, versus a convenience benefit that's non-pecuniary. Uh, so empirically, what we're working on right now is try to get a sensitivity estimate with respect to bank fundamentals, such as uh, return on assets or, or other proxies that measures bank health and show that it's uh, similar to the fluctuation in rate sensitivity. Uh, our model uh, is actually perfectly consistent with uh, fundamental driven runs because fundamental value is what coordinates uh, depositor behavior. Uh, so, so that's consistent with the, the paper that's uh, mentioned as well. Um, uh, the steady state question on QE and QT, that's very interesting. What we can say is that the QE and QT will have long lasting impact in our framework because of that switching cost. That's gonna uh, make the depositor base uh, path dependent. Um, whether it'll exist in the super long run or the steady state, uh, we'll have to think a bit uh, more about that uh, more carefully. Um, and, and finally, uh, the, the point on um, the LCR is what we're working out right now to see if the liquidity regulation uh, is fully capturing the depositor sensitivity over time. And relate to Amy's question, the way we're trying to look at this is in the cross section of the banks. Banks may be differentially exposed uh, to this heterogeneity of, or flightiness of depositors. So in the cross section, we wanna look at does the LCR measure at the bank level captures the variation of depositor flightiness at the bank level. Uh, so let me end there, I don't want to prevent people to get lunch, but always happy to talk afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>